One of the clearest, simplest, and most obvious directions Scripture gives us is around helping others. The Bible comes back to this again and again. Deuteronomy, one of the bedrocks of the Jewish culture and nation, talks about how we shall not harden our hearts, but will open our hands to anyone who is in need. This theme is repeated again and again when the prophets show up to critique the nation and how it has fallen short. What they start with and what they point out uh, is the way that the nation has not attended to the outcast, the widow, the poor, the orphan. Right? When Jesus shows up, he comes back to this repeatedly with such well-known uh, stories, the, the story of the Good Samaritan, the parable there. And, and so it is fitting that we as a nation, with many Christians in it, give generously. About 40 years ago, this nation, the people of this nation, began giving generously in a way that I do not believe has, been, was, has ever been surpassed throughout human history. This is a very generous culture. Over the last 40 years, there has also been a corresponding rise of short-term mission trips, right? these going off to help people. Something like two million people a year go off on some sort of short-term mission trip. Something like 90% of the population gives yearly to some charitable cause. Part of this is probably begun by, or maybe he was reflected in, when uh, President Johnson declared the war on poverty. Anyone here remember that, the war on poverty? You think, here's your daily moment of snark, we keep on declaring war on nouns, war on poverty, war on drugs, war on terror, and the nouns never lose, right? <laughs> declaring war on a noun, is just, it, it's, you're never going to win against a noun. It, does, it doesn't seem to work. After 50 years of a war on poverty, where do we stand? I can tell you what I see. Right? I see people avoiding this discussion. We don't talk about it much. We don't talk about poverty, people in need. And I think a large part of that is because we have sort of retreated into our caricatures of each other. This is the point in the sermon when I'm about to step on everyone's toes. When you get to the end of it, if your toes have not been stepped on, let me know and I'll come back around and take another swing at it. Right? There, the one caricature, one sort of oh, horrible way of viewing folks, is we, we view those liberals that are just bleeding hearts and they just want to help and help and help, and, and, but they don't see how in helping people without asking anything of them, they're disempowering and making them worse off and they don't understand what the, the damage they're causing. And that, that's one caricature. Another caricature from the other side is those, those conservatives, people on the other side of the political spectrum, the conservatives, you know, they, they say how they, they want people just to work, but what they're really hiding is that they really don't care, right? If they did care, they would do something, right? And then the third caricature that's floating around is the people who need help, they're just lazy. If they just get off their duff and do something, right? They just get up and do something, they'd be better. Right? Have, I, have I offended everyone there? Have I hit everyone? Excellent. Good start to a sermon. Uh, <laughs> so we just don't talk about it because that's how the, the discussion unfolds often. And, and Lent is a season of repentance to turn away from what doesn't work. And I submit to you that isn't working. Uh, so let us uh, repent of that. Let us try to see with fresh eyes. Let go of those caricatures and, and look and see what we have. What we have that binds all of the people together involved is uh, this practice of charity. Charity is a good word, biblical word. Ch charity is rooted, in, it's one of the translations of the word love in Greek. The, the old King James talks about the faith, hope, and, and charity as the highest love. And so charity is a good practice. It has come to take on a very specific meaning in American culture, though. Charity is giving money with no strings attached. Here, just take it, and that's, that's our practice of charity. How's that working for us? How's that, how's that going? After 40 years of some of the greatest generosity in human history, are you pleased with the results? Right? I believe that our practice of charity has unintentionally become very toxic. I'm not saying that charity itself is a bad thing. We cannot follow Jesus without having charity and love for our neighbor. But the specific way it has developed as a church in America has produced some spectacularly bad results. To describe this, 
I want to look at a phenomenon called generational poverty. Not all poverty is generational. The majority of poverty is, is transitional. You go on to some sort of assistance and you come off of some, for, some, some form of assistance within about two years. Like Most of poverty is, is, is transitory. Um, but the generational poverty, right, that, that's where it's easiest to see this. If a family is in poverty, which uh, for a family of four that's making less than 24,600 a year, um, start receiving uh, TANF, temporary assistance for needy families, SNAP, uh, which is a supplemental nutrition assistance program, food stamps, section eight, housing starts going to food pantries, uh, adopt a child at Christmas, start tapping these resources. What we're doing, I believe, is we're training people to be beggars. We're training people to get more by emphasizing how bad off they are. Right? The way you get more is to point at how bad you are doing. The incentive is to be more pathetic for the more pathetic a person or family is, the more they get. And so over time, we have created this monster called generational poverty through giving charity in such a way that disempowers the person receiving it. This type of charity warps relationships horribly. For charity, you give someone help once, ah, thank you. You give it twice, now it's a pattern. You give it a third or fourth time, now there's a sense of an entitlement. And if you stop, then everyone's angry, right? Everyone ends, it ends up being problematic. We have created a, this sort of beggar relationship. And the relationship gets all messed up in that the, the person giving has a set of expectations for the person receiving. Like, if I'm going to give you what I have, I would like you to do something wise with it, right? I would like you to do something that is appropriate and fitting and grab yourself, your bootstraps and pull yourself up. But again, think of the incentive. You're getting help because you have told someone how pathetic you are. Right? You're tra there's an exchange there. You're trading your dignity for assistance. And, and so the incentive, the reward for getting yourself put together and doing what you're asked to do is that you won't get the help you need to get by. Right? The incentive there is off. It's wrong. Overseas, our approach to charity, I don't think it's doing much better. In the years leading up to the 2010 earthquake in Haiti, America sent eight, what was it, eight billion dollars in charity and assistance. And the long-term impact of sending eight billion dollars is a 25% decrease in average income in that country. Right? It hasn't helped. No strings attached, massive charity damaged Haiti. A banker in Nicaragua, which is a name of a country that I can barely get out, Nicaragua, uh, does micro-lending. If you've never heard of micro-lending, this is awesome. Like micro-lending, you take a family and you give them like three months wages for their, their cultural context. Enough money to do something like buy a cell phone so that when you sell your harvest, you can check the market and see what the right time is. Right? Or, or you give someone enough money to buy a motorcycle so they can do a, be a taxi in the city. Or you, you give someone enough money so they can buy the, this stock to start a, a, a business with. Right? And these micro-lending, it changes one family at a time. It's like a 95% repayment rate. And, and I mean, you can set it up in, in pools, too, like a group of people that's like 10, 15 people where you give money to one person and the other 14 are going to help and, and help repay, and then the next person in line gets a loan. Like, mi micro-lending is a practice that is changing people's lives in a powerful way. And it works all across Nicaragua, except for the places where Christian missionaries are showing up, short-term missionary trips, right? Because what those villages have learned is if someone, they shouldn't accept, why should they accept a loan that they have to repay when someone from America is going to show up and do it for them and leave a bunch of money when they leave? Right. Our short-term mission trips, this short-term, this approach, like, it, it, let's say we wanted to do it tomorrow. It would take about 30 grand, go down and paint a, a, a school in Nicaragua. What have we done? We've painted a school. We spent 30 grand. That 30 grand could have hired two painters down there for them to do it, and then paid two teachers for the year, and then bought uniforms for all the kids. 
Right? We spent our 30 grand and we feel good about it, but what we have done is damage the local economy by taking business away from the local contractors. And we could have done so much more than just paint it. And let's be honest, no matter how good you paint, are you as good as a contractor? Nope, right? I am firmly convinced that the American way of pro practicing charity has become toxic, and I am even more convinced that we can't stop it because we follow Jesus. We have to be loving people and serving people. We have to. We have to love our neighbors in a way that is responsible. We practice charity, we have to find ways to practice charity that is both grace, gift, but is responsible grace, taking seriously the consequences, the long-term implications of how we help. I know that charity as it has been practiced has been done with the best of intentions, but my friends, good intentions are not enough. I get tired of feeling like I'm spinning my wheels. Like, I have been involved with charity practices for a long time now. Right? And to, to feel like what I'm doing when it comes to charity, am, am I truly helping or am I just kicking the can down the road till next time? It is my belief that the church holds the key to responding to such a challenge in a way that is not only faithful to the gospel of Jesus Christ, but is also transformative of those who receive charity. For I believe that when the church gathers, we are able to be charitable in a way that is not toxic, but is actually responsible for how the gift of charity is received and used, how it shapes those of us who give as well as helps those of us who receive. Now, what does that begin to look like? I started to grapple with this, um, as I've mentioned before, as a street pastor in Durham for two years, and we started to have a set of practices and assumptions, because you, you just gotta figure out how you're going to do it. We will, we'll go out there, we set up a, a table, put out a home-cooked meal every Monday at two, and then people would come out of the woods, and we'd eat, and we'd pray, and then things would happen. Things always happened. Um, and we quickly realized that I, we could only work as hard as they worked. Right? If you were going to work at trying to make a difference, I will, I will work as hard as you work. Right? But if you're not going to do something, then we had a baseline. And the baseline was this. No one died alone, no one went cold, and no one went hungry. That's where we drew the line. I will, I will work as hard as you work, and if you're not going to work, I will at least make sure of that. Right? And this is, as we realize, this comes out of our practices realizing things like... Um, if someone had to make a phone call to the court to start the process of getting their, their driver's license back, if I dialed the courthouse and handed them the phone, nothing changed because it, it was me doing it and then they, no. I'll hand you the phone and here's the phone book. You, you make the call and I'm right here to help you if you need it. Right? It's got to be your call. You have to do something. You've got to have some skin in the game. I, I believe this is profoundly biblical. Like when we read out Leviticus, what's the practice? The practice was, leave the corners of your field unharvested. The practice was not, harvest your entire field, take what was in the corners, grind it, bake it, and go give it away. The practice was, leave the corners unharvested so that those who are hungry, they could go and gather and grind it and bake it and have what they needed to eat. Right? I will work as hard as you work is sort of our modern interpretation of leave the corners of your fields unharvested. I will work with you, but you got to show me something. Right? As I've been grappling with how we do this as a church, I, I've come across uh, the guy who's taken everything I've just told you and he takes it one step further and he is a far wiser, decades more of experience than I have. And... Um, a guy by the name of Robert Lupton, and he put together a book called Toxic Charity, from which a lot of crystallizes a lot of what I've presented to you today. And he also put together an oath for helpers, and it's on the front of your bulletin. If you want to be able to help people, read that. Put that in your Bible, and every time we ever talk about helping people, pull that out and read it, right? Because this is your guide on how to help people in a way that really works. It's harder, but it actually works. Right, he starts, never do for others what they could have done for themselves. Right, don't teach people to be pathetic, to get ahead. If you can do it, you do it. I'll help you. You do it. Limit one-way giving to emergency situations and seek always to find ways for legitimate exchange. 
there will always be situations in which someone needs help right now, right? Someone is hungry or cold or sick, and they just need someone to step in and just give till it's fixed, that immediate situation. There will always be emergencies. And as soon as the emergency is over, it's time to figure out something better, some way of exchange, some way of practicing this, right? Some way of working together that respects the other person and their gifts. Whenever someone would walk into my office, it hasn't started here in Shelvina. It happened all the time in Milan. Someone walks into my office and, and they needed help. We would sit down and we would talk through your finances, your expenses, your income, your budget, your, your long-term situation. How did you get here? What might work? Right? Is this a bill that needs to be paid or do we need to pay for a U-Haul so you could move in with someone like, what's the entire situation? And then the last piece of it was always, if I'm doing this for you, what are you going to do? Right? If, I, if I'm helping a shade tree mechanic to help with a water bill, you're on the hook for me. The next time someone comes in and needs some help with a car, you're going to help me out. I'm going to send them off to you because you owe me one now. And that's exchange, right? right? If I just give it to you, then we've established a power dynamic where I'm in power and you know, right? But if it's exchange, then I've respected you. I'm treating you like an equal. and We're naming that I got something and you got something too. Equals. That respects the other person. It empowers them. I will always seek to empower the poor through hiring, lending, and investing, using grants sparingly as incentives that reinforce achievements. It takes more time to do this than to just write a check. You write a check, it's quick. But you invest in someone, it's sustainable. And then you don't have the same problem happening again and again. I will put the interests of the poor above my own. How often do you hear people talk about, I help people because it makes me feel good? Right? Does it feel good to help people? Yeah. The danger of focusing on how good it makes you feel to help people is that sometimes it's not going to feel good. I promise you, there are going to be times it doesn't feel good. Are you going to keep on helping? We don't help because it feels good. We help because we follow Jesus Christ. Sometimes it feels good, great. Sometimes it don't, doesn't matter. We follow Jesus. I will take time to listen and carefully assess both the expressed and the unspoken needs. Gotta drink some coffee. If you try to help someone in anything less than the amount of time it takes to drink coffee, you're not really helping. You got to sit down and help a neighbor, not just throw money at a problem. Above all else, I will do the best of my ability, I will do no harm. What's this start to look like? Here's an example. Food pantries are great. We've got a food pantry here, right? You help someone who's hungry, great. You've done something good. You know what's better than a food pantry? Food co-op. You put together a food co-op, here's what it looks like. You take 20 to 30 people, they each put in three bucks a month, and you, set up, you work out with a business. What the business offers is direct access to wholesale prices. It's not costing the business anything, they're just ordering a bit more, and then that co-op, right, everyone throws in their three bucks, now you gotta organize it. You gotta have a president to run it. You gotta have a process by which you vote for what you're gonna get, so you get what you need, not just the stuff that comes into food pantries is not always exactly what you need. Uh, so you get what you need, what you're actually going to be able to cook so you don't waste. And then you need a treasurer. Got to keep track of the money. Then you need a secretary, right? All these 20 to 30 people that are gathered in a, in a co-op, you are now, everyone in there is taking responsibilities for their food and involved, and three or four of them have leadership positions. And so you're developing leadership. Now they know that they can do something. And they have a group of people that they're in this together. And that doesn't mean you stop having the food bank because you're always going to have those emergency situations. But what people find is when you have the co-op too, the people, amount of people that go into that food bank go way down. Because if you offer people the chance to be involved in something that respects, involves them, and honors them, that empowers them, that's what they're going to do. Right? This is a matter of imagination. When we're engaged in a problem, to stop and to take the time to listen and to imagine what can we do that is better, that honors, that empowers, that works with someone.
These principles, they work, and it is my desire that as we start to figure out how we're going to be involved in our community in the future, that we use these so that when we love our neighbor, we make sure we're doing both. We're loving them, but we're treating them like a neighbor. Because in the end, we want to love people and treat them like people the way that we would want to be treated. Right? Investing in others, it takes a lot more time but that's what Jesus would have us to do. Amen.